and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I really like your laugh lines. They don't make you look old, they just make you look nice. Never get Botox. Absolutely keep that. It's Thursday, and so we're going to do Thinky Fun Time. This is where I bring on a author or a think tank leader or a particularly intelligent warlord, maybe a uh, eloquent mentat, something like that. We're going to bring on Tim Carney in a minute talk about his book, and it's a topic near and dear to my heart because I think that it is a very important one. Uh, I have mentioned this before in the program, but I'll do it again. I think that in the future, when people are looking back on the period that you and I are in right now, they're going to see it as twofold, as being a time of momentous technological change, of just incredible. I, I think right now we're living in a, a time period similar to not just the Industrial Revolution, but the invention of writing. Just a game changer with instantaneous communications where you can talk for free to someone on the other side of the planet. That's amazing. Uh, and and the, the kind of things that are going to be around the corner, I, th I think, are also equally stupendous. Now, that said, I think the same people that look back and go, wow, wouldn't that, wouldn't that have been an amazing time to be around? They're also going to go, I wouldn't want to live then. Because they'll look back and they'll go, what a lonely time period people in the 21st century were living in. What a just alienated period. They'd, they'd figured out the technology, but they hadn't figured these other things out. And the opioid crisis was on the rise. Depression was on the rise. Deaths of despair were on the rise. But just in general, even away from the really big things, people just spent a lot of time hanging out in boxes by themselves watching Netflix. You think about it, our species has been around, what, about 300,000 years? 300,000 years for, for Homo sapiens. We think... Um, Modern Homo sapiens, so you, me, everyone you know who can talk, we've been around about, I think, 200,000 years. Uh, and for most of that, for 200, uh, what would it be, 180,000 years, pretty much every human being on the planet was on a permanent camping trip with their best friends and family. That was the day-to-day -day existence of mankind. And we came along uh, recently and went, you know what, I'm going to live in a box with maybe one other person, I'm going to watch a lot of TV. And I think it's really, really damaging. So I'm excited to talk to Tim Carney here in a minute about that and his book. Before I do jump into that, uh, and before I get to the commercial, uh, because we do have to pay those bills, I want to follow up on something. Uh, a couple of you have emailed me about the show we did last Friday, where I mentioned that I was planning to get a dog. And you wanted to know if I got a dog, what kind of dog, that kind of thing. So here's the situation with Heaton trying to get a dog. So as I mentioned, I volunteer at the uh, Dallas Animal Services two or three times a week fine institution. Highly recommend that you check them out. And uh, I had been eyeballing a couple of dogs. Uh, one of them was a puppy, and one of them uh, is a, uh, a six-year-old Labrador mix uh, who happens to be blind. And I would, I'd go walk these dogs and play with them. And I, the puppy, I kind of thought, well, that could be fun because it's a puppy, right? Everybody likes puppies. They're, I mean, they're, I think objectively puppies are, are cuter and uh, a little bit more fun uh, than older dogs. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of work, you know, because you, you got a like I, I have an apartment uh, and I do have a dog run next to me, but I don't have a yard and, and it's just me. So I thought, oh, that seems like a lot of seems like a lot of effort. Um, probably better to meet women with a puppy. I'm not getting a dog to meet women. I want to be very clear on that. However, it has occurred to me that that's probably a better way at this point than an app. I don't know if you've used a dating app in your mid 30s, but you might as well just. It's, it's like your phone is a garbage disposal of hope and money. You're just walking around. So why, why, not, why not walk around with a puppy you know, next to a lake and, and uh, someone will either run into me and give me a phone number or just hit me with a Land Rover, one of the two. But I, the more I thought about it, though, I went, you know, uh, puppy, good idea in that regard, lots of fun, but I don't think I have the time or the energy for a puppy. I think a puppy probably necessitates having like some kids or at least roommates. That way it's getting lots and lots of social interaction. Uh, and if I get a dog, I don't want to get a dog that I'm not taking good care of. So I thought, no, uh, at this point, six-year-old blind dog, that seems more my speed. That seems like a dog I can keep up with. I think I can handle that. And I think I would be really good at it, too. So uh, last weekend, I bought like, I bought about $300 worth of dog accoutrements. I got a dog rug, uh, bulls, leash, uh, all that stuff, right? And I got all these tennis balls because I've been playing fetch. The dog's name is Dottie. And I've been playing fetch with Dottie. Uh, I'll take her on a walk when I'm at the animal shelter, and then I will, um, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll go into a pen and we'll play fetch because she's like she's looks to be half, 
half Labrador Retriever, half sneaky neighbor dog. So that Labrador Retriever bit is still active regardless of the glycoma. So I'll play I'll play fetch with her, which not Olympian level fetch. I mean, it's it's fun, but it's not I mean, it's nothing. It's not this is not the fetch of Titans. You know, she, she only wants to go like four or five feet. Uh, but she'll if she stumbles into it, then she can pick it up and bring it over. And I'm like, yeah, good job. Good job, Dottie. Right. So this was my thought Buy like a dozen 14 tennis balls. And then if when I get this dog, take her out to the dog run and then just load the field full of these tennis balls from the dog's perspective. I have I, I'm just playing fetch with it. Right. But through sheer blind probability, that dog is probably going to stumble into a tennis ball. So from from my perspective, I've littered the field with tennis balls. From the dog's perspective, I'm like, hey, Dottie, get the ball. Whew. I threw the ball. The dog's like, well, I'll try and get the ball. Don't be too impressed, but with the glycoma. But then you're going to stumble into a ball at any point within five to six seconds. The dog's going to think it's a rock star. It, it like I must have some kind of magical power if it's always nailing a ball, right? So that's good for the dog because the, the self-esteem's good. And it's also less work. And still, and, and then the, the fetching is happening. And like uh, retrievers still like retrieving, even if they can't see it. So I, I mean, my point is, I put a lot of thought into this, and I got all these tennis balls. And I thought, well, I, okay, you know what? I think I'm up to this. I think I could be a pretty good owner for a blind dog. And, and I, I, I won't go into it, but like, I thought maybe I'd get like a fountain, like a water fountain in the apartment, as opposed to like a stationary dog bowl. That way the dog could hear the water running. So I really put in a lot of thought on this. So anyway, Saturday, I go to the uh, animal shelter. And um, I'm gonna. I, I, I wanted to check and see if the if it was going to be open on Sunday, which was Easter, to to get this dog. I was going to adopt this dog. Uh, I I walked some other dogs first, which in retrospect is perhaps emblematic of a fear of commitment issue that I should probably seek professional help on at this point. So I I did walk some puppies. Um, and, uh, and then, and, uh, like there was also this German shepherd that, uh, I'm not going to adopt, but it seemed like it really needed the company. Uh, and at the end of the day, anyway, uh, I, I get to, um, I was like, Hey, I'm going to take off. Uh, I think I'm going to adopt that, that six year old dog with the, uh, with the, uh, the glycoma Dottie. And, and they went, well, she's been taken by a rescue group. And I'm like, well, okay, that's fine. Can, can I call them? Let them know like, Hey, good news guys. You don't have to do any work. You've already got a, an owner lined up that has all these tennis balls. And they're like, no, for, for privacy reasons, we can't do that. Uh, for privacy reasons, um, you, you, can't, you can't reach it. We can't tell you the name of the group, which, I, what am I, am I going to like show up to this organization's lawn at night and hold a boombox over my head? Am I going to you know, go try and watch it have dinner? It's an organization. I don't, I don't see why that needs to have a, a big privacy thing. So anyway, I said, okay, well, can you let them know that I'm interested in adopting Dottie, the six-year-old uh, Labrador? And they went, yeah, we'll let them know. And they're very nice people, but I, I did not gather a lot of confidence uh, from the outcome of this, this phone call that's going to happen. I, I do not get the impression that there's a red phone connecting the, the Dallas Animal Services to whatever group apparently really regards its privacy. Uh, and so uh, I have not heard about Dottie the dog. However, if, uh, if you're in the North Texas area and you work for an animal group and you have what appears to be a mid-aged Labrador mix with not very good vision responds to the name Dottie reach out to me because I have I have all these tennis balls and and a dog bed and it, it's it looks like a dog lives in my apartment and uh, uh, I'd sure like to get one so anyway um, God this went off the rails where uh, yeah uh, I'm still working on the dog thing uh, thank you for for um, looking into that okay um, sponsors we need to do that okay so <clears throat> All right. Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is brought to you by Carbonated Scotch. You ever stop to think what your preferred beverage says about you? For example, if I see a young woman seated at the bar wearing a halter top and a short skirt, swirling a pineapple daiquiri and giggling, I think, pineapple has a lot of vitamin C in it. She must be really worried about scurvy. Best steer clear of that one because I am not going to bang another pirate. Or let's say you see a guy at the barbecue drinking an American beer right out of the bottle. No pint glass or anything. I look at a guy like that and I think, you look tough. But you know who the hell uh, who would beat the hell out of you in a fist fight? A pirate. Now let's say you're on a carnival cruise and your ship gets attacked by pirates. And you catch a glimpse of the pirate captain drinking a mojito. I'd think, that pirate seems kind of needy. Which brings us to Scotch. 
Scotch is a drink of power and rumination. When you take a sip of scotch and stare into a fireplace, people think, that guy's seen some stuff, like trench warfare, or premonitions of his own untimely demise. There's nothing quite like narrowing your eyes to slits just before you take a sip of whiskey and then smile knowingly as you toast your panic-stricken arch nemesis. When you're on a date and a woman orders a scotch and kicks back a gulp of single malt with a come-hither look, you know there's a pretty good chance you're going to break some furniture making out before last call. Now at this point you might think, huh, scotch seems kind of intense and violent, a bit dour even. And that's where carbonated scotch comes in. Carbonated scotch has all the hyper-masculine intensity of sieging a castle. It all the levity of a glass of champagne enjoyed over brunch with friends. It's refined like a librarian with a monocle, but bouncy like a ballerina on a trampoline. Carbonated scotch from Glen Kevin. It's like the whiskey is screaming. My guest today is Tim Carney. He is the commentary editor at the Washington Examiner and a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And for our purposes, he is the author of Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, so you're, you're part of a, a, a kind of corpus of work that I'm, I'm really intrigued by because I think that it's very important talking about the kind of eroding social connections that we have in our country, and I imagine in other places today, and how detrimental that is. What, what got you started writing this book? Frankly, it was the rise of Donald Trump. Oh. Um, Donald Trump came onto the political scene and said the American dream is dead, and that really resonated with a lot of people. And so from my perspective as a columnist, a journalist trying to understand our country, I thought, why do so many people think the American dream is dead? From a distance, you could see sort of you know economic numbers doing pretty well in 2015. You had unemployment was falling. You had the GDP, the stock market high. Um, and if I look, if you look around a lot of places, the kind of places where most of us journalists live, uh, the American dream is alive and well on a level of you know strong communities, strong families, intact marriage, etc. And so why this perception that the American dream is dead? And that's what I I went out looking for. Yeah, I you know when, when that was happening, I was writing for a, a primetime television show. My index fund was uh, my index fund was okay. Everything was peachy. Uh, it was it was surprising to me that, that other people have that. And I, actually, it's one of the things that I think is very interesting about your book because it's um, it's I, I think it's uh, it does touch on Trump, but it's not a book about Trump. Uh, but uh, it, it does kind of posit this idea that whereas a, a lot of the people uh, in the progressive movement would say that the Trump was elected based on bigotry, um, the, the more the the you know the the non progressive thing tends to be it's focused on economic anxiety and that it's you know people that have been displaced in the Rust Belt. Uh, I got the impression from from your book that you sort of viewed the 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 Trump phenomenon at least in the primaries as almost a a referendum on pessimism. And whether or not uh, your community was was upwardly had a good trajectory or bad trajectory. That's exactly right. I mean, there, there, the old phrasing, the dichotomy was: is this an economic thing or is it a cultural thing? And the economic explanation was: oh, it's just about factories shutting down. And the cultural explanation was: it's just about bitter old white men upset that they're losing their privilege. And I argue that that's a, a, a false dichotomy. And if you wanted to pin on anything, you could say: yep, yeah, this is about a, a cultural thing, but it's a real cultural loss. That what the what makes America great, what is that the American dream, to use a sort of a couple of kind of hokey phrases, has never been just a robust economy. It's been really strong institutions of civil society, strong communities on the local level from which people get connection, people get a human level safety net, people get a sense of purpose, and that that is still strong in a lot of places, some strong uh, religious communities and in a lot of elite circles, but is definitely eroding much, much faster in a lot of working class America, a lot of middle class America. Economics plays a role in starting this collapse, but collapse of communities, of human connection is at the root of people believing the American dream was dead. Yeah, I um, uh, so I, I just spent the last six years in New York, and the first, maybe the first three years I was there, at least the first two years, I had this weird phenomenon where I had friends, and I had a girlfriend, and I felt lonely all the time, and I couldn't figure it out, and it, it didn't really come into place until I, I joined a club. 
uh, and I had a group of friends that I was seeing on a regular basis. I, I was in an improv team, and I was. And it, it was this odd thing where I, you could look at my life and go, "That guy's got tons of friends and lots of bilateral relationships," which is very much how people, you know, describe friendships. Uh, yeah. But but I didn't I didn't really feel I didn't feel connected, and I didn't feel at home until I was part of a, a community itself where we had some sort of shared identity together, uh, and. Uh, I, I suspect that that is a rife thing throughout the United States of people that maybe have some friends, but otherwise go home and watch TV. No, and that's exactly right. Belonging to something is absolutely key. And the the story I tell in the beginning of Alienated America is about when our our daughter was uh, was sick. She was one, and she was having trouble breathing, and we had to put her in the in the hospital in the intensive care unit for a week. And this was a big burden, but we had. So so many many people help out. My son even commented on how it was the best lunches he ever had at school <laughs> was for that one week when we weren't making him lunch because we were at the hospital, but other people were bringing stuff. And I was talking to somebody about all the all the stuff we got, and I said, "Oh well, that came from a couple at our our swim club. That came from a couple at our parish. That was a, a family. Uh, that's a woman in my wife's book club. This is somebody else I work with at AEI. Somebody else I work with at the Examiner. There was always sort of a hub, an institution that made it not just be friends who like each other and occasionally get together, but um, made it be something that you belong to, that you contribute to out of whatever you can, knowing you're going to pull out whatever you need, that those institutions, that's really, I mean, if you've read Alexis de Tocqueville, he said in Democracy in America, those institutions constantly forming is really the most amazing thing about America. And it's it's what makes uh, access to the good life possible. And so that's why it's erosion, particularly among the working class, is, is really uh, troubling. Yeah, that was one of the things that really struck me. Is I, I think that there's, um, w we we all have a tendency to get into a bubble. And uh, like you, you mentioned, one of the things in the book was that I think it's right now twelve percent of uh, the American public has a college degree. I think that that number is right, but it's the, the vast majority of people in the United yeah. States don't have a college yeah. degree. Um, and I, I would I would imagine that probably most of the people listening to this program have college degrees. Most of my friends have college degrees, not exhaustively, but most of it. And it and I I kind of I hadn't realized that 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 idea of a strong community uh, is has sort of withered uh, within the working class. Uh, you, you, I mean, you also point out in the book that we almost have this sort of romanticized version of lonely yep. rich people living in mansions by themselves, and uh, and you know the working poor getting together at the you know the the local firehouse diner and all that kind of stuff. When in reality, it's it's been inverted. Yeah, I know, and you're right that that is uh, kind of a story we tell, and there is certainly alienation in in a lot of elite circles, and it's very easy for any individual to end up in a point where they're not connected to anything, regardless of their situation. But if you look at it on the whole, the fact is that you're much more likely to belong. You're even more likely to go to church if you're in the top quintile of income. You're more likely to be married. You're more likely to belong to things, to do volunteering. All of that stuff is more likely the more educated you are and the more money you make. Now, maybe it tapers off at the 1% where you're all, you know, um, you know Hollywood actresses or whatever, but in the, the top 20% in education and in income is more likely to belong to something. And this is really rooted in a problem that goes back decades. And uh, Charles Murray wrote about it in, in Coming Apart, that we're more segregated. And so you've got more of the kind of Type A personalities, the PTA moms and the and the little league coaches are all living in in a couple towns, and so much of the rest of the country is uh, is left. You know, if you are going to go to college, there's a brain drain effect where you get up and you leave your small hometown. So too many places don't have the the the, the starters, the leaders, that sort of thing. And so yeah, you end up with the elites and a few select religious communities that I write about in the book mm -hmm. with these really strong uh, communities. But so much of the working class is left alienated, less likely to go to church, less likely to belong to anything. Yeah, and I, I, that, that had surprised me. I would, have, um, I would have guessed that religious attendance would have been... I, I knew that, uh, that, that marriage had declined with, with working class people. I had not realized that there was this sort of um, just disenfranchised, like, I, I believe in God, but I'm not really religious, that, that the religious uh, attendance had really declined, and that just the, the general uh, bottoming out of community. When, when you look at that phenomenon of people balkanizing and turning into these atomized units, um, how, did that, how does that play out for a person in terms of the negative effects, and how does that play out for the, the, the community that they're in? Yeah, so to be... Um 
to be disconnected makes it harder to uh, make meaningful friendships, makes it harder to find a spouse. Um, there's sort of less resources for connection to somebody to help you find a job, somebody to give you career advice. Married couples are less likely to stay together the less connected they are. Um, it's harder to raise kids because you don't have as much access to either babysitter or just a social event where you can bring your kids and ignore them. I, my <laughs> wife and I have six kids, and I am a major advocate of taking your kids places and ignoring them and letting them play with other <laughs> kids while you and socialize with other adults. That's a huge part of what our community institutions uh, provide us with. You're more stuck having to do all the work yourself of whether it be parenting or trying to build your career or anything like that, the more disconnected you are. And so the result is you get less family formation. You get more drug addiction, more dropping out of school, the less connected you are. And so then that ripples out on the community level um, in a vicious circle that when um, a diner shuts down because people aren't going to it, then also people know each other less and they're less likely to sort of be drawn into other activities. And uh, Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone used the bowling league as the example, mm -hmm. but you got the bowling league, you got the church, people stopped going to those things. And um, then they shut down and then people are less connected and they're less likely to even get out of the house. Alienation um, I use the word alienated in the title because a great old definition of alienation is not just being disconnected from society, but having trouble even seeing the point of belonging to these things. When you're not in them, it's easy to, to miss what their, what their purpose is. And so that's, I think, where, where you end up going. And it's, it's, again, a vicious circle. Yeah, I, uh, I, I mean, I think there's both the, the, the kind of uh, emotional malaise that sets in with being disconnected. Um, one of the things that I hadn't really given a lot of thought to until I read your book was, and, and I, I wouldn't put this as the, the top reason to be a part of a community, but I hadn't really thought about the, um, the career ramifications of being plugged in. That uh, like I, I kind of noticed this when I moved to New York. I went to a, a state university. I went to a public school. Uh, when I went to New York, I, I hung out with some friends at, um, say, like Ivy League clubs, and I had no idea what, I mean, I, I thought it was just, you know, you, it was sort of a credential you got, like you went to Harvard mm -hmm. and then you were good to go. No, they are, they're chugging away, getting each other jobs. Like there is a real conveyor belt that phenomenon worked. going yep. on and, and after you've graduated as well. And I, I assume that that happens on some level for, for people in general that are good at, you know, going out and forging community. But I, I hadn't realized how pertinent that is to being able to climb that socio, uh, socioeconomic ladder. No, that's exactly right. And if you've read Hillbilly Elegy, J.D. Vance, that was the biggest shock, is that he was sort of this kid who was exceptionally bright and hardworking and lucky and got out of uh, a broken family in a, in a suburb full of alienation in Middletown, Ohio. Um, and when he got into Yale Law School, the first thing that surprised him was how much of what was done was just dependent on meeting people and connecting with other people. He just thought everything was going to be, you know, tests and ways to display your aptitude, and he didn't realize how much it was, hey, um, oh, yeah, you, I graduated from Yale Law, too. Let me get you an interview with this person or, or whatever it is. He didn't realize how much that, that networking is, is one way it gets put today um, was, was valuable, but I think that's just a subset of that belonging to something is just the best way to make sure that you're going to be able to pick up the life advice, the knowledge, the little tidbits that you can't just search for. We have this modern technology and searches and job boards, and you think, well, if there's something out there, I can search for it. But we know in our life, often you find out about things that are useful because somebody else mentions it to you. So no, no search engine is going to replace just being plugged in and knowing other people who say, hey, you know what, you might benefit from this. Yeah, I, I, all of that makes total sense to me. I, I think it also, there's a, um, de depending on what, what, what groups you're a part of, I think you, you become more comfortable and familiar approaching other folks. So like uh, when I was a kid, my dad was in the state legislature. By virtue of that, like I have no qualms about going up to the mayor or whoever and talking to them, but I've, I've seen other people have a difficult time doing that. Um, but I think that that goes in all, like I, I don't mean to portray this as a dichotomy between, you know, the in-group and the out-group. Uh, I think that the, the takeaway I got from your book was not that there are sort of elite institutions that people are kept out of, but rather that there are just communities that have folded up uh, and that, that being a part of a community itself has that uh, that innervating or that energizing and also, you know, sort of knowledge helpful networking capacity. 
No, and that's right, and that's the key here. It's not that the working class is kept out of elite uh, elite networks and their own networks are powerless. It's that increasingly the working class is less likely to be plugged into any network, any institution um, than the elites are. That's that was one of the things that surprised me. It's it can be kind of obvious to say, oh, these Ivy League people all help out one another, but it's also just not true that. Um, that there's a bunch of sort of working class blue collar networks that used to be that used to be true. It used to be true that, you know, the Polish neighborhood in Philadelphia, everybody's plugged into each other. And guess what? They did pretty well, even if they didn't have a bunch of Ivy League guys in their circle. Um, But now that's less true. You've got elite circles. You've got some really strong religious circles. Uh, but you don't have uh, a lot of strong institutions of civil society in working class America. And uh, uh, I think for a lot of people reading Alienated America, the thinking about the, sh- the remaining really strong religious communities might be the most interesting and eye-opening thing. I write about Dutch reform people in the Midwest. Yeah, villages Newtsburg. Where everybody has it. Yeah, everybody is named Holly Vander something. Um and they all go to church twice on Sundays, and they, they it's sort of the small-town America that a lot of people think has disappeared still exists in the places where really strong churches have did a lot to build the institutions to keep it up. And so if you've presu- ever presumably been to Salt Lake City, Utah, I was about to say, Utah's probably doing pretty well. Yes, and with upward mobility, Utah is the top. Uh, happiness, by a lot of measures, Utah is the top. And they've, they've got tons of things to keep people connected. Um, and some of it is explicitly for members of the church, but so many of the good uh, outcomes trickle out to people who are not Mormons, not members. Uh, and that these are, the sad thing is, though, that these are the exceptions, that a lot of uh, religious denominations, a lot of parishes, uh, most congregations in middle America don't still have the strength, don't still really serve this um, purpose as a sort of doors open to everybody. You come in and you're connected. A lot of them are, are crumbling and losing me- membership and getting old. And this, But I wrote about the, the Dutch Reform and the Mormons sort of as the exception who are producing uh, extraordinary results and sort of keeping them, that idea of strong small town America alive, while in a lot of rural America, you're, you're not seeing that strength and that connection. So, so then, um, on that note, if we get out of the, you know, the major cities, we're not talking about New York, we're not talking about uh, Chevy Chase, where, where you live, which you, you, you uh, detail pretty well in the, in the book. If we're getting out into middle America, and you're looking between a, a place that has very strong social capital, and a place that doesn't have social capital, uh, what are the differences between them then? Is it just you, there's more of a church life? There's more diners? It's mostly, like- it's mostly church um, is, is the, I think, the key causal factor here. That for the working class and middle class in this country, historically, the, uh, the, the main institution of civil society has been church. In yeah. a secularized country, the elites have other things to turn to, whether it's really strong public schools, country clubs, etc. So that's the main causal factor. Robert Putnam and Bowling alone wrote that 50% of all civic activity begins in the church. So that's your soup kitchens, that's your little leagues, that's your social clubs, that's your potlucks, etc. All begins from a church. So that's the main thing. If you want to find non-elite communities that are strong, Almost without exception in this country, they are anchored in a strong church that has um, that that has made an active effort to really build community. So then, with with the the declining, you know, I I, I completely uh, agree with your your assessment of what's going on. I think that we've we've got you know kind of uh, fraying society, particularly civil society. Um, social capital is declining. People are more alienated. Where, where do you see is, what is causing this, and where do you see the sort of instigation point of declining social capital? I think there's all sorts of causes. Um, the first, I, I group most of them into two different uh, categories, and they may sound contradictory, but I think they go together. And one is over-centralization, and the other is hyper-individualism. And over-centralization means government, first of all, that uh, for one thing, a centralized safety net can sort of drive churches and organizations out of business by displacing them, and there is a lot of crowding out. But also an over-centralization of our attention. You know, the media, where we now know more about Michael Avenatti and Michael Cohen than we'll ever need to know, but a lot less about what's going Meanwhile, on. Meanwhile, yeah, I, don't, I can't remember my next-door neighbor's name. Like, I think yeah, it's Trevor. Exactly. I'm not sure. 
Um, and so that is, those are two symptoms of over-centralization, but also a hyper-individualism where some people's idea of the American dream is that we, uh, you know, that you're unfettered. You get to do whatever you want and nobody, nothing gets to hold you down. And I understand that and that's good, but in some ways, anything meaningful is going to involve really belonging and committing yourself to something. And so if an aversion to commitment is part of your idea of, uh, of the American dream, then that really does undermine strong institutions and the way we use technology and we make our own entertainment and information feeds and all of that is, is, is liberating in lots of important ways. But one downside of that is that we have uh, less in common. And so the, the over-centralization sort of binds us stronger to the central government power and media stuff, but then it dissolves our kind of horizontal bonds with, with our neighbors. And most importantly, our connections to these intermediate mediating institutions that exist on the local human level, we get unplugged from those as we all either join the resistance or join the Trump train or watch MSNBC or, you know, our, or what we need, our regulations, our, our welfare, et cetera, all comes from uh, one central source. Yeah, I, I'm with you, and I'm, I'm I, as someone that's fairly firmly in the secular camp, I look at a lot of politi- uh, the, the politicization of American culture right now as a kind of, I, I don't even know if I want to call it a religious proxy. I, I think that there's a lot yeah, of that's politics that's become religion. For a religion. Yeah, that's either a replacement for a religion or it is a new religion. Yeah, I, I have, a, I I have a purpose definitely. in the morning. I'm going to go meet people at a rally or a protest, and we're all going to sing songs about our values, and we're going to link, and it's like, I'm like, right, that's okay. You've, you've, found, a, you've found a terrible religion. Whichever political group you pick, you pick just a heinously depressing religion, but okay. No, but so the problem is if it's not oriented towards um, things that it can achieve, then it's it's going to be ultimately fruitless. Yeah, bo- most words, of them are predicated on smashing the evildoers, I find. And I, I'm not a fan of Manichaean right. religions. Uh, so that, yeah, I, I, I find those. Uh, but, you know, before we go further, I do want to clarify just a couple of terms that we've been we've been throwing around because I don't know that we've defined them. Can you can you just clarify quickly what social capital and what civil society are? Yeah, so social capital, when I, I told the story about the, my daughter in the hospital, I thought that was a good demonstration mm-hmm. of it, that sort of we had something valuable economically a pure economic tool which was health insurance which paid for a lot of this but then as far as making our lives not go off the rails while we're trying to stay in the hospital with our one-year-old that's where we drew on our deep reserves of social capital um, that we because we had spent and I'll, I'll make the sort of investment analogy we had invested a lot in various institutions mostly time, also attention and care, to some extent money, but mostly we did the work that it took to belong to these things, not for the sake of sort of building up an insurance and a a safety net, but one of the effects of that is that all of these institutions, there was plenty of uh, almost a store of value that we had put in there, and not in any transactional way, but in a relational way and that then we were able to draw from that. And we didn't even have to actively draw from it. It all came out. So social capital is sort of very valuable connection. And and the, the financial metaphor, you don't want to go too far, but it it does work because it is, it's stuff you would pay a lot of money for. Hey, I got to run out. Can you watch the kids mm. while I'm gone to your next door neighbor? Hey, you know what? Um, the, the, somebody taking over the carpool. Yeah, you could have just hired Uber to do it, but we had people um, stepping up and doing it. So and and you, you've got some really good social account. psychologists that have attempted to quantify that with money as well, where uh, I, I can't I think it's the guy that wrote Flow or um, – I, I can't recall the specific book, but uh, if you meet with a group of people, I think it's once a month. If you've got like a monthly book club or something that they've, mm-hmm. it, it's it's a pretty good, it's about the same as getting a $10,000 raise in terms of your overall happiness. Just yep. to have like, it's, you either work really hard to get $10,000 at the office or just join a monthly book club. And if you join like a weekly club, then you're like, it's it's incredible the amount of, the, the amount of emotional return you get back on it. Um, no, that's exactly right, and that's what sort of a really strong neighborhood and like being connected to your actual next door neighbor is. It's like joining a daily club, right? Yeah, I, you um, know, and I, I got to say that's something that I I hope I can get to that point, Tim. Uh, I am I am somewhat rootless right now. I've been in New York the last six years. Now I'm in Dallas. I've been here about six months. Um, so maybe I'll get more planted there. When I was a kid, uh, we I knew I think I knew all the neighbors in our neighborhood. 
we knew each other by name. We we didn't like hang out weekly or anything, but we had like a monthly or we had like a barbecues over the summer. And there was this one guy, Jack, who none of us liked. He was kind of a bloviating, you know, bloviating guy that'd come over and, and be crass and things. But he got sick. We'd bring him casserole. And I, yeah. I just I looking back on that, the fact that that so indelibly marked my mind of we don't like that guy, but we're going to take care of him. That there was a sense of of comfort knowing that, well, I must be surrounded by other very good people that are going to take care of me if I fall off my bike or whatever. No, that's and that's exactly right. And it's um, and one thing that we do, I notice in my own life, uh, we know our next door neighbors. We got to know one of them a lot better since he somehow got seven puppies and gave us one of them. <laughs> and so now we're constantly getting together over dogs. So I feel like. <sighs> a park slope yuppie, even though I have six kids of my own. But anyway, um, one of the things that I realized we, um, we live in a suburb where we have to drive everywhere and we send our kids off to the older ones off to an all boys and all girls school and they build these intense little platoons that draw us in. But the effort and the time, the sophistication, the resources it takes for us to build a strong community around us because physically it's not exactly there by the shape of our neighborhood. Um, it's hard. You need uh, it's a husband and a wife. We're we're married. My wife's able to stay at home. We are able to afford two used Japanese cars, and we have enough friends that can do it. It's more manageable for people who already have resources to build the communities in the world today. And it's a lot making it a lot harder for working class people to pull it off and cobble together community that's not there as naturally as it was when we were kids or especially, you know, 60 years ago. Yeah. And I, I hate to get wonky. I'll get I'll get emotional again in a moment. But I, what, what, there were a couple of things that you had in your book that, that surprised me um, from kind of a policy side that I hadn't seen coming. And one of them was the sort of unintended consequences of local zoning laws, which sounds so wonky libertarian. But. Uh, but I, I, I got to thinking about it and I was like, you know what, if you could like, if you could sell sandwiches and coffee out of your house and you just do that, yeah. probably people would come over to your house and, and drink coffee and eat sandwiches. And if you, if you want to open up a diner, but you have to have the, the, the requisite amount of municipal parking spaces and you're like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'll yeah. just, I'll, 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 I'll yeah. just do a turbo tax instead. Like, oh yeah, I can kind of see how that we've inadvertently eradicated walkable culture. No, and that's right. That requiring and uh, requiring parking for a thing is basically saying you have to serve a region instead of a neighborhood. Yeah. And so then the shape of the the physical shape of the built environment changes, um, and then it becomes a place built for cars. Right. And cars aren't people. And it's uh, as a parent, the way I think about it, if if my kids can only do fun stuff if I drive them there, that's a huge hassle. If my kids are more likely to get hit by a car, that's terrifying. If you can get to a place where the kids can run around or ride their bikes around, then they're more liberated. The parents are more liberated. Life is is, uh, is so much better for everybody. But uh, as you're describing, the way we sort of made a decision to, uh, or our parents made, generation made a decision to build things for cars yeah. makes community a lot harder. Yeah, I think when you when you see newer cities like like me hailing from Oklahoma, uh, you can just see these giant swaths of the city that were planned like probably around 1920, where you know cars are starting to come mainstream, and we went, no one will ever need to walk again. And there was just this sort of bullish prediction that no one would ever want to walk. Uh, and now you have, you know, my generation that's like, uh, I guess I'll get a scooter because I, I, you know, want to be able to go to the local coffee shop. Um, I want to, in a minute, I want to get to the best way to approach this. But before I do that, uh, one of the things that I thought was really intriguing in the book was you, you make this distinction between um, civil society and government, uh, which uh, I think goes all the way back to Hobbes and is a, is a great distinction. You, and you make a distinction between public and private. And then you kind of get into the mindsets of conservatives and liberals when talking about the nature of public and private. And I, I thought that that was a telling conflict. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, there is a, a book called uh, Strangers in Their Own Land, uh, um, written by a baby boomer liberal from San Francisco and sort of his heartfelt effort to better understand, um, uh, to better understand conservatives and, and that sort of thing in Louisiana. And when she was describing the different, first she describes um, this uh, this church that has a big giant slide on it and a playground and it's got a soup kitchen that serves the poor. It's got a coffee shop. And she says, I could see that they saw in that place the same pride 
that we have in our public places. And the, the difference between us and them is that they were valuing this church, and we value what was public. And I just I thought that was weird. And then there's another passage where she talks about this neighborhood that sort of lives on the bayou, and they have neighborhood crawfish boils like every Friday. Sounds great. And I'm reading it thinking, I, I want to live there. Yeah. Says, and part of what made this heaven was that it was all totally, completely private. And then I realized that by private, she just meant non-governmental. And, but she was trying to use the word private and public both in that legalistic term, but then also to make it be um, to carry some moral weight as if somehow this wasn't an institution of civil society. Somehow this wasn't meaningfully public to have this slide. They didn't make sure you were a Methodist before you went down the slide. They didn't care if you believed in God before they served you at the soup kitchen or let you serve or called on you and hand you a ladle and had you serve somebody. And so it was, these things were clearly or, or, or public. Per, per, but, perhaps a, a less august one, but, but a quicker one would be that if you go to McDonald's, you're using a public bathroom. But it's not a government yeah. bathroom. It's privately owned, no, but it's accessible that's to the public. exactly right. So whether it's industry or church, there can be this real distrust of it among too many people on the left who think it only counts as public if it's run for the government, run by the government. So ah, they think it's the only thing we do together, the government. Exactly. Yeah. That, that you're not, we're not all helping the poor if it's not being done through taxes and the government. That it's, it's, if we all have the ability to give and volunteer and donate um, and the poor are being taken taking care of, it still doesn't count unless it's being done through the government. And that different mindset, I think, is really an obstacle to uh, uh, sort of rebuilding a strong community. Well, yeah, that was like you, you uh, not not that I've ever been a, a big Bernie Sanders fan, but I, you know, I, I was impressed with his recent Fox Town Hall. Uh, and I, but I read a, a quote from you in the book that's, I think, when he was, you know, only a, 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 a you know, sort of a pupa mayor. socialist when he was mayor of Burlington, but it basically said, I don't believe in charity. Like, I don't think charity should operate. Yeah. This should be, you know, the social safety net should be government provided. And just like the concept of charity is a bad one. And I was like, what? <laughs> I like I, I I see a role for a a public um a public safety net, but I also see it as probably going to be the 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 most bare bones and uh, emotionless and uh, you know lacking that sense of community that you've been talking about. No, and that's right. And that uh, one of the things that's lost when you lose when you replace charity and community with the state is again the sense of belonging and so i what i tried it my main message for the left with this book is if you care about the working class and the poor you have to stop doing the things that kill the institutions that they belong to you have to stop crowding them out you have to stop trying to chase the church out of the public square because you harm them if you have policies that lead to the closure of the churches and the bowling leagues and the little leagues and the soup kitchens and what what policies would be driving out, say, like little league and and uh, and soup kitchens and that kind of thing? Um, so, there crowding out is a real thing. Um, where I point to studies in Alienated America about government spending, where government spending was bigger, uh, churches and charities were treated more, mm-hmm. and then so and, and not just that in, in, in districts where um, the congressmen were good at pork barrel spending, you tended to see exactly. that more, which I thought was an ingenious way. It was to a go really ingenious out. study done by, if you remember the name, Jonathan Gruber, oh, the yeah. Obamacare guy. Oh, I remember He's Gruber. The one yeah. who did that study, and then uh, on the flip side, where welfare reform was more aggressive, um, there was, uh, where welfare reform was more aggressive, there was more of a rebound in church spending and charitable spending. So would you, and, would you like, would you just unplug everything in welfare tomorrow, or what would you, what, what would I, you I don't think do? you can do that, because you've, the, the, the things have been done that have destroyed the institutions. Um, I, the way I, I think about it is that the first responders, the first line of defense should be voluntary institutions like churches, et cetera, that serve everybody, that are close to you on the human level, and the backups to that should be the more centralized, bigger, mm-hmm. more governmental things. So the the federal safety net should sort of be the safety net of safety nets. Right. Um, is is the way that I argue that that should go. It keeps about. you from starving to death, but it doesn't keep you. Yeah. People. Yes. Um, and so that that's really. But then also there is a. a sense of secularization 
that uh, that the church doesn't belong in the public square. Um, that Nancy Pelosi once said, "I do my religion on Sunday," but no, you can't do your religion on Sunday. Then it's not a religion. Um, and Obama used to talk about freedom of worship, but no, it's free exercise of religion. Churches need to be allowed to be institutions of civil society because they are the biggest one and historically the most important one. So the Obama administration's policies that you know they what their argument in Hobby Lobby was was you lose your free exercise of religion if you're in commerce. Those sort of things have to. And all the state governments saying, no, you can't have Christian uh, principles and operate in the public square. Those those need to end. Hmm. Um, I will. Uh, I want. We're going to have to finish up here in a minute. Uh, and so I want to ask. Um, I'm going to drive it back to me, Tim. Um, so I hope that all of the listeners of this program are just uproariously happy and are, you know, passing out uh, delighted, you know, with friends all around them and family and all that. In my case, uh, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s, I'm single, I am not religious, and I'm in a new city. For me or for people like me that are uh, to some extent alienated, what should we do? Well, as you suggested earlier, the first thing you should do is uh, belong to something. Um, and the best things to belong to are things that are engaged where you you and other people are engaged in a, a joint pursuit that's sort of higher than the individual and outside of yourself. So, we, you know, people are supposed to do good work and love other people and serve. I mean, that's what my Christianity teaches me, but I don't think it's an exclusively Christian teaching. Um, and so fi- belong to something that's uh, enjoyable and sort of dedicated to something uh, bigger than yourself. Okay. And that, that is, that's absolutely, I think, step number one. Not everybody is called to family formation, but uh, I think most of us are. And that's the easiest way to to do good work and to love other people. I wake up in the morning, so Jesus tells me, you know, you're supposed to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. I wake up every morning, and there are hungry, naked people running up to me every day, and I have to give them clothes, and I have to feed them, and this gives me a sense of purpose. But, again... Uh, family is is only one, and it's a small institution. Belonging to a bigger institution, um, uh, to multiple overlapping institutions, I think is really important to happiness. And then would would um, so I, I went swing dancing last night. That is an institution because it's we're we're a, a, a community body. But I'm I'm inferring from your answer that it would also be good to be a part of one that has some sort of. Uh, mission to it in addition to yeah. you know socialness and frivolity that there's some sort of altruism involved exactly yeah and i you don't have to use the word altruism but uh um and even if it's self-improvement um in a meaningful way that that's good but again better is uh looking to help people who who really need help um and that that could just be looking to help people who are outside of the group or it could just be a sort of mutual aid kind of thing um sort of the men's group at my own parish is that kind of thing um and uh that that's what i would look for so anything you belong to is good it gets better it provides you better results the more that it's a joint higher purpose outside of yourself okay uh, Tim Carney, I really enjoyed your book. I think it's very important. I'm glad you wrote it, and I'm really glad that you took the time out of your day to come on the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. Real quick before we go, I don't have time to get into this, but uh, I think the at least initial Hobby Lobby decision that happened in the lower district courts of Oklahoma was a uh, spot-on one from a, a brilliant juridical mind, and only later on. Did the arguments that Tim alluded to perhaps take on this sort of animosity towards the private sector and that sort of thing? Just want to quickly clarify that for no personal reason whatsoever other than a respect for good jurisprudence. That said, let's do some listener feedback. On iTunes, Missouri Douglas writes, I keep coming back for the drunken rant on the Federal Reserve still yet to happen. Oh, man. So, all right. So uh, you didn't like as much the... um, the back and forth between me and Gene. I did agree to get drunk and ran about something, didn't I? Which uh, I, I really should do. Okay. Um, I don't know that it's going to be the rant. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be the Fed. However, uh, I mean, I can guarantee you I'll be drunk at some point in the next couple of weeks. We might as well put it on film uh, and, then, and then have Jennings just follow it like a hawk 
to make sure I don't say anything, you know, career ending. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm very nervous about that, which tells me it's probably going to be good. So, okay, all right. You've, you've renewed my interest in, uh, in, a, in a rant on, on camera. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll look into that. We'll look into that. You can watch this whole show on YouTube. If you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, then you can see my handsome bearded face and assortments of suits and occasionally waistcoats and the dead bison we screwed to the wall. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer will only make you seem more sophisticated and amusing. I know this from a personal experience I had years ago in the barrios of San Juan Capistrano, where I once got out of a street fight by flashing my phone at the armed man whose mother I had accidentally insulted with my poor Spanish and yelled, don't hurt me, I'm on TV. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. I look like a shop for clothes in Bill Nye the Science Guy's closet, and he's not home. Yeah, that's fair. We probably there's there's a lot of parallels between me and Bill Nye the Science Guy, who instantly taught me to make uh, ta taught me how to take selfies. True story. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. And given the timbre of today's conversation, don't you want to connect orphans? I sure do. Thank you and good day.